I recently learned of the story of a talented musician, Alfred Gertler. Alfred had a serious climbing accident while he was working aboard a cruise ship, and his ankle was pulverized and had become very badly infected. After multiple surgeries and IV pumps of antibiotics, he remained unable to clear the infection and couldn't even stand. The bacteria had built up so much in his ankle that they became isolated from antibiotics, and he could survive the infection only if he stayed on antibiotics and remained off his feet. Unable to play his instrument, the stand-up bass, or play with his children, the doctors had recommended amputation, and Alfred was facing an unpleasant future. There are many of these stories. For families facing the consequences of extreme or persistent bacterial infection, it is difficult to say which stories are the most heartbreaking. Those where individuals suffer for many years or those where the work of the bacteria is quick and final. A new review suggests that by 2050, the number of individuals who will die of antibiotic-resistant superbugs is expected to outpace even cancer at an estimated 10 million people per year. This is an honestly frightening prospect. I can easily look back at my life and think about the number of times that I have taken antibiotics that have saved my life. I'm sure many of us can. We had miracle drugs and we did not recognize their worth. We have overused and abused this precious resource. Today, I don't wanna just tell you scary stories and I won't be telling you that I have the ultimate solution, but I wanna tell you a little bit about why this is happening to us and also why many of us still have hope for the future of medicine. The answer may be found in tiny viruses in the soil beneath our feet. The bacteria that trouble Alfred are common in our environment. We truly live in a microbial world. This planet has been molded by the invisible life evolving on it for the past 3.5 billion years. And today, we believe that there are 10 to the 30th, nearly a nonillion bacteria sharing the earth with us. That's 10 million trillion microbes for every human on the planet. The air that we breathe, the photosynthesis that we rely on, and the nutrients that feed the plants that we eat, all of these things are really the result of the microbial world that surrounds us. The antibiotics that we rely upon in cases like Alfred's were not first developed by scientists looking for ways of combating bacteria. These are actually weapons that we have borrowed from the microbes that they have used against one another to compete for food and for space. Antibiotics have been in the news of late because pathogens, the bad bacteria that make us ill, are increasingly being found to have acquired the ability to resist the antibiotics that we have relied on. How are they doing it? Antibiotic resistant bacteria are really the inevitable product of natural selection. This is the same gradual process that Charles Darwin and others have described as the survival of the fittest. As we use antibiotics and as we expose bacteria to low levels of these drugs, we make acquiring resistance to antibiotics more beneficial. Acquisition takes place in the natural world through a process that I have studied in depth called horizontal gene transfer. Microbes are waging a war against one another. And if antibiotics are like the weapons that microbes use against one another, then antibiotic resistance elements are the countermeasures that they develop in response to those weapons. This makes horizontal gene transfer a little like a black market for the designs or the plans to build bigger and better weapons and shields. These plans are traded accidentally through sharing tiny bits of DNA left on the battlefield. Sometimes, this DNA movement happens when a virus picks up the DNA in one cell and moves it into another. Understanding the rules that govern this gene transfer is part of what I work on. And if we can understand these rules, perhaps we can use that information to change the rules, or even to predict what transfer events are most likely to occur in the future. I wanna take another moment to focus on those viruses. The viruses that infect bacteria are called bacteriophages, or just phages. Physically, they look like something from a spaceship or War of the Worlds. A phage often has a protein shell, often with a long tail, and at the end of the tail there might be a spidery-looking attachment that the phage uses to recognize its hosts. 
Phages are a little spooky looking, but they are actually incredibly common, and you are literally covered with them right now. Phages are 10 times more numerous even than bacteria. They are simple, inert protein particles adrift in and sitting on every surface that we come in contact with. The remarkable thing about the way that they function is that specificity that I mentioned. They are so specific in their bacterial targets in the microbial world that unless they find the correct match, like a key in a lock, they will simply keep drifting. However, when they bump into the correct host, they do an amazing thing. They use that tail to insert their genetic material into the host cell and completely take over the cell machinery. A phage can force a bacterium to make up to 100 copies of itself rapidly before the phage ruptures the cell and these copies are released to start the cycle over again. The other amazing thing to me about bacteriophages is how easy they are to find. This is my third year of taking my undergraduate students at Massey University on a phage hunt. Using a safe target organism, we are able to take the students through the process of finding new and unique bacteriophages that have never been discovered before. Over the past two years, my students have found 10 novel phages and are sequencing these genomes to help us understand what these can do. This year alone, we have found at least four new phages that are able to infect a close relative of Mycobacterium tuberculosis. These are new viruses that may be able to seek out and destroy this pathogen that the World Health Organization calls one of the world's top infectious killers. Bacteriophages are the single most numerous entity on the planet, and as the natural parasite of bacteria, these entities have a great deal of promise as a therapeutic agent in our battle against bacteria. Of the remarkable advantages that phages offer, they naturally amplify at the site of bacterial infection, and they are recycled after they are done. When we take antibiotics, we are often negatively affecting the good bacteria that we have in our bodies, a little like setting off a nuclear bomb in our internal ecosystems. Phage have this property of being so specific, so phage therapy is almost like sending in a trained assassin or a ninja. Phage therapy is currently practiced in Russia and Georgia and saves lives. As we are nearing the crisis that is the loss of effective antibiotics and seeing a growing number of superbugs, phage discovery and description is an important part of bringing the potential of this therapeutic approach to the rest of the Western world. It's actually a very hopeful time. I mentioned Alfred earlier. You can read about him on Betty Cutter's Evergreen blog. Alfred was able to travel to Tbilisi, Georgia, and after 10 days of in-hospital phage treatment, he was able to make a full recovery from his bacterial infection. Today, Alfred is able to play his bass, play with his children, and generally to live once again. He considers the treatment he received in Georgia to have dramatically altered his life. In fact, it saved his life. Phage therapy is not a practice that is currently accepted in Western medicine. This year, 2015, marks 100 years since the discovery of bacteriophages, and we have learned a lot in that time. With careful research, I hope one day to see phage therapy used across the globe, and in the meantime, my students and I are contributing to learning more about these tiny ninjas in the microbial world.